ቀደም እንደጀመርኩት ለቀጠለ ሄሎ ኤቭሪዋን ማይ ኔም ኢዝ ፈቃደ ስላሴ እንግዲህ አሁን ቶርቻ ለታረጉኝ ነው በእንግሊዘኛ ዊሽ ዘ ሪዘን ዋይ አይ ትራይ ቱ ዱ ቱ ዱ ኢት ኢን እንግሊሽ አስ ማች አስ ፖሲበል ኢዝ ላይክ ዩ ኖ ዩ ኔቨር ኖ ሰምታይምስ ዩ ኖ ሰም ፒፕል ሁ ሃቭ ሊሚትድ አማሃሪክ አንደርስታንዲንግ ካን አልሶ ዩዝ ኢት ዋን ዌይ ኦር አናዘር ያው አወር ኢንቴንሽን ኢዝ ቱ ሜክ ኢት ዩ ኖ አስ ግሎባል አስ ፖሲበል ኢፍ ኢት ኢዝ ፖሲበል ኢን ዘ ፊውቸር ሶ አወር ፕራይመሪ ፎከስ ኢዝ ላይክ ዩ ኖ ቱ አድሬስ ሜዲካል ስቱደንትስ ሁ አር ሎኬትድ ኢን ኢትዮጵያ ዊዝ ኢን ኢትዮጵያ across to ethiopia so i hope like you know amharic language is not going to be a problem i know that to most people but you know i'll try to do it in english as much as possible but for sake of convenience sometimes i may also you know include some discussions in amharic if i find it easier to describe some some things in amharic so my name is fakara selassie heno mogas because i go by mogas here that in ethiopia people know me by fakat aslase henok so if you are new to this project if you are new to this uh, lectures uh, i was like you know i studied in black lion in addis ababa university all my studies were in black lion actually undergraduate then general surgery residency followed by cardio thoracic fellowship and then you know part of my fellowship happened in india in south india Uh, there is a big uh, an institution named Christian Medical College and it's located in uh, in a city called Velour and the state is Tamil Nadu if you have been to India if you are familiar with India and i have part of my training was also in Sweden so i did part of my training in Gothenburg in a city called Gothenburg Salgren Scottish Hospital is a very big institution very famous for cardiac transplantation lung transplantation and all that so part of my cardiothoracic fellowship happened there and after I graduated so I worked as an attending I was part of the department of surgery actually like you know since the day of my graduation so I worked as a member there for about 12 years until I came over here So I also worked as a visiting professor in Karolinska Institute in Sweden which is located in Stockholm it's a very famous institution it's the institution which gives Nobel prize in medicine and physics so and actually I mean back in 2015 I got the opportunity to attend one of the Nobel lectures so that was interesting and that year those people who won the nobel prize uh, did their job on tropical diseases so it was a very good coincidence i was there by chance so i did take part on that one so to come back on our project so these lecture series are dedicated uh, for all medical students in ethiopia like i said earlier and the main intention is not really to help you pass your exams that is not the main uh, intention the intention is to make you familiar with most of the surgical problems and so that once you become a full fledged physician like as a gp or a specialist in every in any specialty for that matter if you have this idea you can help our, our people better that's the main intention you will be a better physician i hope it will help you a little bit to become a better physician so whenever you are studying of course you know your primary goal is to score well in your exams but you know you have to medicine is a little bit unique in that regard uh, in a sense uh, you know we are not only focused on in passing our exams successfully but because like you know this is an applied science you you apply it in your day to day activities so you have to really study hard to become a better physician so today we will continue our uh, discussions from where we stopped in the past so those of you who has never who never had the, the opportunity to watch our uh, presentations there is a youtube channel brook could also be advocating about it later on so you can always go back and watch those videos so that you will maintain the continuity that, that way so where do i where do i share uh, my slides there is a share screen here right okay good <coughs> so i will try to 
Raj as much as possible so that I will be able to cover as many topics as possible today. So last time we stopped on this particular slide, so this was about amputation. So today we'll be starting by discussing a little bit about hernia, and there are also a lot of other topics uh, which I am hoping to cover today. So hernia, simple definition, it is just a protrusion of tissues through a defect in the fascia and or muscular layers that normally contain it. So if there is an abdominal wall, in this picture you can see this is an anterior abdominal wall. So if there is any defect in the fascia or in the muscular layer, or if there is any defect in the anterior abdominal wall, then there is going to be a chance of protrusion. So hernia means some content is protruding through a wall, you know, in a defect, through a defect in the wall, which is containing it. It's a simple definition. So there are different types of hernias which can happen in the abdomen, in the abdomen, through the abdominal wall. So you can see here, this is epigastric hernia, just, you know, below the xiphi sternum in the epigastric region. So here is the belly button. So if a hernia happens around the belly button or the umbilicus, you call it periambilical hernia. And uh, lumbar, lumbar hernia happens here. You can see the dot here. Umbilical hernia is around here. <coughs> Paraumbilical hernia, para means just around the umbilicus. So notes, actually, it's, it's not a defect through the umbilical, it's through the umbilicus, but just above or lateral to it. So we call it periambilical or umbilical, uh, paraumbilical hernia. So if it, if the defect is through the umbilicals, so we call it umbilical hernia. There is another rare kind of hernias, pigillian hernias. So the most important ones are the ones like, you know, which we see quite often, especially in the elderly population, especially in men who have got certain, you know, predisposing factors for inguinal hernia. So the other category is inguinal hernia. So you can see in the inguinal canal, in the inguinal region, there could be an inguinal hernia. There is another hernia called femoral hernia, which happens more in females, right, so than men. But still, even in females, the commonest hernia around, around this region is inguinal hernia. But in comparison between females and males, femoral hernia is more common in females as compared to male. So anatomical classification of abdominal hernia, you can see there are ventral hernias. These are the ones which are classified as ventral hernia. So we have the epigastric hernia, periambilical, umbilical hernia. Lumbar and spilligian uh, hernias are classified as ventral hernias and the others are categorized as groin hernia so like i said femoral hernia and inguinal hernia are those categorized as groin hernias okay so <clears throat> so this is a common um, um, back in the days when i was a medical student as well as uh, an instructor in black line so we used to really uh, ask in the cases you know you guys are lucky nowadays you are not lucky actually <laughs> in a sense uh, people are like you know giving you questions uh, which is based on computer your exam is computer based right now uh, last time i was in addis in september during uh, black lines qualification examination and i saw that like you know students were like having their short exam based on computers even the long exam based on computers since there is no patient interaction i really felt bad i know why that was done it's mainly because of the covid pandemic covid 19 pandemic but like you know maybe now the pandemic is almost over i presume so you know going back to the traditional way of examining medical students might be good because like you know you study pictures and that's it and uh, and we cannot really assess your skills and the skill you do need it because like you know in the actual patient reaction interaction you need to have that basic knowledge of how to examine patients be, be it like you know surgery or internal medicine so <clears throat> i hope they will go back to the old traditional fashion so we used to uh, have like you know one hernia patient during exam and all that so we have to study we have to know how to examine hernia and all that so there is other classification so normally like without any surgical intervention prior surgical intervention prior surgical history some people may have a defect in their abdominal wall and they may develop hernia but for some reason if there is any weakness <coughs> or those people who have got especially the ventral hernias are most of the time 
most of the time related to prior surgical intervention. You know, people had abdominal surgeries and then there is a defect in the fascia, especially if the fascia doesn't heal. And if there is a defect in the fascia like this one, you know, patients might develop like, you know, incisional abdominal hernia, but the parambalical hernia, umbilical hernias, most of the time they are just congenital defects in the fascia and patients might develop, you know, hernias in those, in those uh, defects in the abdominal wall. So the umbilical hernia, most of the time, like I said, it's, uh, it is, you know, through the natural defect, but incisional hernia, for example, if a patient had surgery for stomach surgery, uh, anything, you know, cancer surgeries, ulcer surgeries, you name it, whatever the case is. So if there has been any any surgical intervention and when you repair the layers, if there was a defect or if the healing was not good and there is fascial dehiscence or the fascia is defective, then you can have incisional hernias a direct inguinal hernia, inguinal hernia start further classified into two, as you know, there is a, what's known as direct inguinal hernia and indirect inguinal hernia, and there is a femoral hernia. So we can talk a little bit about the difference between, you know, direct versus indirect inguinal hernia. So, okay, in a minute. <clears throat> so what happens is whenever there is a defect in the anterior abdominal wall, you can see this is the anterior abdominal wall and there is a defect here, so with the fascia, so with the muscular layer, this is a subcutaneous fat as you see and there is a skin here. So through the defect, there is a protrusion, like we said, it's a protrusion of a certain content from the belly through the abdominal wall defect. So part of the intestine can protrude, sometimes only an omentum, only omental fat might be, you know, protruding, especially that's very common in patients with parambalical hernias, umbilical hernias. So the content of the hernia is most of the time is just like, you know, uh, an omental fat. Uh, sometimes it could be part of the bowel. In most of the time, it's the part of the small intestine which protrudes because the small intestine is mobile, it's long segment. So sometimes part of it could protrude. So the other thing you should know whenever there is like, you know, hernia, there will be a sac. So the sac would be containing whatever is protruding. And there is the part called the neck. So the problem is if the neck is narrow, and uh, the, the, you know the sac is containing a big content so the protrusion was easy but uh, reduction might be very difficult so the content might remain within contained within that sac and it, it might remain there and uh, it might become stuck there and it might become unreducible most of the time hernia has a tendency to protrude and the content has a tendency to come back or it reduces by itself or the patient might manipulate it and reduce it by some manipulations that's a possibility but sometimes it gets in there and it, it fails to come back so if that happens if the neck is narrow then there will be a buildup of pressure within this sac when the pressure builds up initially it compromises the venous return because you know the veins they have low pressure system so they get compromised and then what happens is the wall there will be further edema formation whenever there is uh, edema formation the pressure increases and increases it builds up then it may cut off the arterial supply which is coming to this segment of the bowel then this part becomes you know incarcerated uh, that means you know the blood supply gets compromised and then it becomes gangrenous eventually so that's one of the complications of hernia right so incarceration, strangulation. Strangulated means it goes out and it fails to get reduced. So there is no as such compromisation in the blood supply. It just gets strangulated. There is no way for it to come back to the abdominal cavity. But like, you know, if the strangulation stays for a longer time before you can reduce it, then like I said, due to the process I mentioned, there could be a compromise in the arterial supply, blood supply. And then that part of that segment of the bowel might become necrotic. Uh, we call it incarcerated hernia. So that's a complication. And if you diagnose incarcerated hernia, you have to really act fast to avoid, you know, further complication. Because like, you know, it gets uh, incarcerated means the blood supply is cut off. Then, you know, the next step is going to be ischemia. So it's incarcerated, blood supply is cut off. 
then part of that 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 body or part of that the segment of that intestine would would start dying it becomes ischemic it dies and then it becomes gangrenous when it becomes it's gangrenous then it's dead so the wall becomes weak fragile it can perforate right so when it perforates it spills of its contents so then there will be peritoneal contamination so a simple process which started as a simple strangulation would go to incarceration ischemia gangrene perforation you know uh, then a spillage of content and then eventually peritoneal contamination peritonitis and if you don't really treat the peritonitis, a patient develops become septic, septic shock, eventually this is, this is a vicious cycle. So that's why we really need to understand the hernia and its complications. And you can see the patient is experiencing belly pain. So can anybody volunteer with voice to tell me how a patient with a strangulated hernia or incarcerated hernia may present to you in the emergency department? Can someone try? I do see 19, uh, 17 people, so you should be able to answer this, okay? Uh, just feel free, this is, a, this is a good opportunity for you guys to revise these things, so just come forward, you know? It's a good exercise. So you can turn off your camera if you are not interested, but if anybody is interested to speak up, I'd be more than happy. Guys. Don't be scared, just try, because like, you know, the whole idea of this discussion is to assist you, to help you understand better. So when you try, I can assess your knowledge base. And then like, you know, that gives me an opportunity. If I have to do more job, that gives me an opportunity to know, you know? If you know it, you will make me proud. Um, if you try, that's also fine. If you are like, if you, your answer is wrong, that's also completely fine. Betty, go ahead. Mm, uh, maybe pain? Yes, it's not maybe, like you can see in this picture, right? So this, this chap here is like in pain, right? So abdominal pain, crampy abdominal pain. Excellent. What else? Um, um, it's non-reducible. Yeah, it is non-reducible, yes. Yeah, uh, so somebody comes with like, you know, doctor, there used to be something which used to come out. I used to reduce it easily, but today it just failed. I couldn't re reduce it further. And then now I'm experiencing this pain. So other than that, other than the pain, what else could be the presenting complaint? Mm. Cough and pulse What, what, the what? Trigger it, again, but cough and pulse. Oh, the cough impulse. That is physical examination. I am asking you how much. Oh, doctor, I don't have a cough impulse. Yeah, I'm a patient. The patient wouldn't be telling you that. That is something which you would be de demonstrating during physical examination. Uh, what I am asking is, what are the presenting symptoms? What the patient would tell you, you know? Symptoms, not signs. So what will happen, to give you an hint, what will happen if part of your gut is strangulated like this, what will happen to it? So the continuity is somehow somehow cut off right here, right? This part is not communicating with the rest. Okay, so go ahead, whoever wants to answer. I cannot see, yeah, that's Arkan. Go ahead, it's Arkan, please. It gets uh, ischemic. The blood yes. flow will be discontinued and we'll have systemic symptoms like the person in the picture is having sweating or fever. Yeah, patient might be. Disease. Yes, mm -hmm. if the patient comes very late, like you said, if there is sepsis, if there is septic shock, whatever patient might be diaphoretic, patient might, might have some other systemic toxic symptoms like, you know, fever, right? So patient might tell you, oh, I have fever. I have a sweating. Yeah, this is a late, late presentation. Actually, the patient has been has stayed like you know a little bit longer time, and that part of the bowel is ischemic, and complications have happened. But like early on, like pain is an early presenting complaint. What else could happen? Do you think like you know in this intestinal content can pass easily from here to this part? So because if, if we assume this is a proximal part, it has to go this way and come this way, right? So what will happen? This part is already cut off, right? So what will happen? Obstruction symptoms? 
Excellent. I mean, you know, obstruction symptom, obstructive symptoms. Yeah, that's it. Intestinal obstruction. So patients with strangulated hernia, their presentation is inter symptoms of intestinal obstruction. So if part of the intestine which is strangulated, which is non-reducible, is a small intestine. So patients present with signs and symptoms of a small bowel obstruction, you know. Yeah, most of the time, you know, the large bowel is not, you know, part of a hernia for many reasons, because the ascending colon, the descending colon, as you know, they are just fixed to the posterior abdominal wall, so they are not mobile. So if at all there is like, you know, protrusion of part of the, lar the large bowel, it could be either the sigmoid colon or the transverse colon, which have got a long mesenteric attachment, they are mobile, they may protrude through a defect, but the, the, the defect should be big enough to accommodate the large bowel. So it's not really common to see large bowel uh, protrusions through uh, hernia, but if you have got incisional hernia, especially like, you know, somebody who have got these uh, midline incisions for big surgery, then, you know, if the fascia is defective, then, you know, part of the large bowel could, or could also protrude through that defect. But most of the time, especially in inguinal femoral hernia, Part of the intestine which protrudes through those kind of small hernias are small intestine uh, segments. So patients will present with signs and symptoms of small bowel obstruction. So what are those symptoms? Vomiting? I'm not able to, yeah, yeah go ahead. Huh? Vomiting? Yeah, vomiting, yeah, go ahead, don't stop. Just, you know, tell me without stopping, just vomiting, okay? Constipation. Constipation, okay. Abdominal distension. Abdominal distension, yes. yes. Yeah, abdominal pain, failure to pass feces and flatters or constipation, uh, repeated vomiting, nausea, you know. So these are the main symptoms. So abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting abdominal distension, failure to pass feces and flatus. These are the common presenting symptoms of intestinal obstruction, a small bowel obstruction, and the patient will be explaining that symptoms. And if they come late, like you said, they may also have systemic symptoms. They may be uh, having profuse sweating. They may have fever, tachycardia, and all that. On physical examination, like you said, there could be systemic manifestations. Vital signs may be deranged depending on the clinical state. So if they come late with sepsis, septic shock, there could be tachycardic, tachypneic, blood pressure may be in the lower side. If they're in septic shock, they may come in shock. So the blood pressure might be less than 90 by 60. And on abdominal examination, you would see abdominal distension. You may see visible peristalsis. I had a bit beautiful picture. I, I don't know how I missed that. I should have added this. You know, I had a very beautiful picture, a lady who came with femoral hernia. She has this visible peristalsis. It looks like, you know, you can even see loops of intestine through the abdominal wall with like, you know, movement, visible peristalsis. So visible peristalsis could be there. Loops of intestine could be visible on physical examination. And of course, you would definitely see the uh, protrusions through the abdominal wall defect. So you may try to reduce it and it may it may be challenging to reduce it. If it is difficult to reduce it, don't really push hard because sometimes, you know, that segment is already fragile. It's ischemic and when you push hard, you may perforate it. If you perforate it, you are complicating it with peritonitis and all that. So if you cannot really reduce uh, content, don't really push hard. That has to be taken care of during the time of surgery. Okay, that's one of the things you should know. And uh, on uh, on hernia examination, so there are certain things you should really focus. So there are certain characteristics on physical examinations of a hernia so versus abdominal wall mat. So, if you see some mass in the inguinal region or in abdominal, in the anterior abdominal wall, so the possibilities are either there is intra-abdominal mass, which is pushing the belly, it's entirely within the peritoneal cavity, that's one possibility. The other is the mass could be originating from the abdominal wall itself. There are different differential diagnoses for anterior abdominal wall, wall mass. I will ask you in a minute. And the other possibilities is possibility is a hernia. It could be hernia. So your difference when you are thinking of you know differential diagnosis about a mass which you see in the anterior abdominal wall, you have to think in terms of differential diagnosis. It's not only hernia. It could be anterior abdominal wall mass. So how do you differentiate between?
when an anterior abdominal wall mass versus hernia is very important. So if it is an anterior abdominal wall mass, when you examine it, it's going to be somehow firm, right? So it's not going to be somehow smooth like uh, an intestinal content because it's either originating from the fat or, or it could be originating from the skeletal muscle. We call it rhabdomyoma or rhabdomyosarcoma if it is malignant. Uh, the other one is it could be arising from the fat tissue itself, liposarcoma or simple lipoma can happen. So lipoma, liposarcoma, rhabdomyoma or rhabdomyosarcoma. These are the common uh, angiosarcomas, extremely rare. This can happen in the anterior abdominal wall. They can arise from the anterior abdominal wall. So those masses, when you try to characterize them, then you know they could be fixed. They and their consistency might be you know firm to hard if it is malignant and all that infiltrating. It may not be mobile. And when you ask the patient if the patient was lying on a bed on a supine position, and you ask the patient to go forward like this. If the mass is arising from anterior abdominal wall, it becomes more prominent. Okay, it bulges more and it becomes more prominent. But if you have got intra-abdominal mass, uh, then you know you may still appreciate a mass. You may see a bulge when you do when, when you inspect the abdomen during abdominal examination. You may see a symmetry between the sides of the abdomen. And then when you palpate, the mass should be able to move during your inspiration because intra-abdominal, intra-peritoneal masses, most of the time they have a tendency to move with inspiration. And the other thing is when you ask the patient to move forward, if you have a doubt whether this is an anterior abdominal wall mass or intra-abdominal mass, when you ask the patient to move forward from a supine position, then the mass becomes less prominent. You know, that way you can differentiate between mass arising within the uh, abdominal cavity versus mass arising from the <coughs> anterior abdominal wall. And if we, if this mass is particularly hernia, like you said, hernia is reducible in the history. You can ask a quick question. You can ask the patient, is this mass coming and going? And then the patient says, yes, yeah, sometimes it becomes prominent. And when li when I lie down, it just goes in, it disappears. It, 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 it just looks like as if it is no more there. So this is a very typical history, reducibility. So the patient can't tell you that the mass was reducible. Now it's no more reducible. That's concerning, okay? So the patient says, oh, this, has, this mass has been there. This thing, this protrusion has been there for five years. Nothing happens to it. This is the first time it fails to go back in. Normally, when I sleep, it just disappears. But today, it fails to disappear, and I have abdominal pain. That is concerning because that tells you that that hernia is strangulated and it's not reducible anymore. All right, so reducibility is key history. And then when you do physical examination, the patient, you know, most of the time asks the patient to reduce the mass by themselves because it's their body. They do it quite often. They know how they can manipulate and bring it back to the abdominal cavity. So they can do it easily. So if you are a medical student and you are given the opportunity to examine her, now just ask the patient, can you reduce it? Can you show me how you bring it back? If you take it back to the belly, then they will do it for you. And then that's reducibility that confirms this is a hernia, you know? And the other thing is, when you are palpating the mass, it's soft because most of the time the content is either it is fat, you know, or mental fat, or it could also be part of the intestine. So it's most of the time a, a smooth mass and it's like, you know, soft and consistency. And then you can put your fingers on top of the mass. If this is a protrusion, you can apply, you can put your hand like this and ask the patient to cough. So coughing, increases the intra-abdominal pressure. So when the intra-abdominal pressure increases, the this mass or hernia, the hernial content will further be extruded through the abdominal defect. It goes in. This is a defect, let's assume. So when somebody coughs, it bulges like this. It bulges more. So when you are putting your hand here over the defect and the patient, the patient is coughing, you feel the protrusion, it comes and touches your hands and it feels as if something is expanding. So that's what's meant by expansile impulse. So when something is extra strangulated like Betty said, I think it was Betty who mentioned earlier, 
So on physical examination, you may, you, that mass might lose its uh, expan expansile impulse. You call it expansile impulse. That's very characteristic of a hernia, intraabdominal pressure increases during calving, coughing, or any valsalva maneuver, straining, coughing, those are valsalva maneuvers which increase intraabdominal pressure, okay? So loss of expansile impulse is another indirect clue that this mass might, this hernia might be strangulated. It's no more uh, reducing, it's no more going in, and it's no more freely going in and out, going in and out through that defect, okay? And there will also be, if it is strangulated and if it is staying there, when you palpate it, there, there will be severe tenderness. Because like I said earlier, when it gets strangulated, the next step is incarceration or you know the arterial supply will be cut off, then that area stagnant dies, then it becomes very painful, okay? So that mass in the past was never painful, but now it's very painful or tender, okay? So tenderness, Loss of expansile impulse, irreducibility, these are clues that this hernia might be strangulated, okay? So this is a closer, uh, because today we are going to focus on mainly on inguinal hernia. So uh, you can see, I don't know if I can, do you see it now more? I'm trying to zoom it out. So this is the anatomy. This is, so. This is the, when you look, when I look at it, so let's assume this is a, where the patient is facing us. So uh, I think this is the left side of the patient. This is the right side of the patient. This is the right side for us, right? So you can see the different parts. So you can see this is the area where, this is the rectus abdominis muscle. This is a midline, okay? This is the midline of the belly. You have got the rectus abdominis muscle in the left, and then you have got the inguinal ligament. You see the inguinal ligament is, here, anterior superior iliac spine, the pubic tubercle. So you have got the inguinal ligament here. Then this, these vessels are called inferior epigastric vessels. These are landmarks. So people might ask you, what are the boundaries of uh, for a defect for direct hernia? So you know, laterally it is the inferior epigastric vessels. Medially it is the rectus abdominis muscle. And from below or inferiorly, you have got the inguinal ligament. So this is the area where you may have a defect in the transversus abdominis muscle. And then, you know, uh, if there is a defect here, people will develop direct inguinal hernia, okay? Direct inguinal hernia happens here. So it comes from there, actually. So this is, we are facing the patient from here. So protrusion through this area would result in direct inguinal hernia. And direct inguinal hernia happens through the inguinal canal. And you have got this uh, deep inguinal ring, and you will have a superficial inguinal ring where you will see, like, you know, uh, contents coming out. Okay. And you have the inguinal canal. So, uh, transversus abdominis muscle, internal spermatic vessels go there as well. You have the spermatic cord as well. A vast difference is there and all that. Okay. And this area, which is located somehow lateral because this is medial vagal nerve. This is a medial aspect. So inguinal hernias are more medial and superior to femoral hernia. Remember that, okay? So femoral hernia, this is the area of the femoral hernia and it is located more lateral because this is a medial. So as you see the uh, both indirect as well as direct hernias are more medially located. So the femoral hernia is located laterally as well as inferior, inferiorly to the uh, direct as well as indirect inguinal hernia. So okay, that's very important. So you can see here mesh covering the myopectineal orifice. So whenever there is a defect, what we do is we apply a mesh because the defect is here in the anterior abdominal wall. So you strengthen it with mesh so that you prevent any hernia coming through this defect or coming through this defect or coming through this defect, all right? So this is almost a repetition of what we have been talking about. This is the right side, now it's a different orientation. So you see the inguinal ligament here, you do have the deep inguinal ring here. And you have got the superficial or external inguinal ring. So this is the internal inguinal ring. 
as this is external inguinal ring and this area extending between the internal inguinal ring and the external or superficial inguinal ring is called the inguinal canal the inguinal canal so this defect this defect sometimes may persist in certain individual individuals then you know any content from the belly could protrude through the inguinal canal goes into the deep inguinal ring comes through the inguinal canal and comes out here through, through the superficial inguinal ring giving you the indirect inguinal hernia it's just coming indirectly through the canal through the inguinal canal but here you have got a defect in the anterior abdominal wall and whatever is whatever content is protruding it's protruding through directly through the defect in the anterior abdominal wall there is no canal it just comes like this it protrudes directly through the defect so this is the area of the direct inguinal canal the inferior epigastric vessels are here they are the lateral boundary middle boundary is the rectus abdominal muscle and you have that is the inguinal ligament down here so this is a basic difference so more medial is direct inguinal hernia and in direct inguinal hernia is more lateral compared to direct inguinal hernia okay that's very important that's very important so on physical examination there is the basic difference between direct inguinal hernia and indirect inguinal hernia so what happens is so this bowel is protruding through the inguinal canal and it's reaching up to the level of the scrotum and this one this is indirect inguinal hernia you know it just protrudes it goes into the deep inguinal ring comes through the inguinal canal comes out of the external inguinal ring and you know continues down to the level of the scrotum so this is indirect inguinal hernia direct inguinal hernia like i said the defect is directly in the anterior abdominal wall and the content is protruding directly through the defect in the anterior abdominal wall there is no way it can reach into the level of the scrotum. So this is one major basic difference between direct and direct inguinal hernia. And direct, if you see a scrotal mass, so differential diagnosis. So I may give you a patient with a scrotal mass, a scrotal swelling. Then what are the differential diagnoses for uh, scrotal mass? Differential diagnosis for scrotal mass. And any volunteer? You know, the other advantage of participation is like, you know, if you participate, engage, you will never forget that discussion forever. I am telling you. If somebody corrects you or if you give the right answer, uh, or anything if you participate anyway that that gives you uh, an opportunity to keep that information retain that information with you forever so is there anybody who wants to volunteer so this is a guy who came with a scrotal mass right so obviously all this intestinal content is coming to the scrotum then the size scrotum will be swollen so patient would be complaining of scrotal mass okay so differential diagnosis I'm no, I'm not watching your, uh, your the chat the chat box, by the way. So I, I maybe some of you are trying to text there, but I prefer for you guys to participate. Yes, but the chat box, yeah, yeah, they are texting their differentials. And but I'm not looking at it. Okay. I want them to engage. That's why. Okay, I can try and read it for you. Uh, uh, don't read it for me oh, okay. they can speak up there. <laughs> <All right. laughs> or if you want to answer you can answer that's fine but uh, your own answer not what other people have said so but you want to go ahead no i mean that's already been written <laughs> that's why no, uh, who, who is speaking it's a which is in god i'm your root no who is speaking who is speaking um Matthews Durban, W. Thomas. Matthews, okay, go and ahead, Matthews. You, you can see. Uh, Matthews, go ahead. So, what are the differential diagnoses for scrotal mass? They are very easy, right? So, one of them is uh, sitting I... in front of you here. So, 
Hydrocele. Hydrocele. Uh, varicocele. Varicocele. Testicularsis. Testicular carcinoma, yes. We call them in general testicular tumors, okay. Uh, and the cysts, different. Uh, yeah, what cysts. kind of cyst? Um, so you said hydrocell, you said uh, varicocell, uh, you said uh, uh, testicular, testicular tumors. tumors. Uh -huh. And I have given you an answer here. There is an answer sitting here. I don't indirect, know why you are ignoring this. Huh? Indirect uh, in guanalernia. Indirect, indirect uh, in guanalernia. By the way, be smart, guys. Okay, so whenever there is a discussion and somebody asks you and the answer is in front of there, start from there, you know, don't avoid it. As it tells me how you are like, you know, smart and use your common sense, then you can go to something else, you know. So indirect, it could be indirect in guanalernia. It could be smer spermatocele. So these are the common differential diagnoses for testicular, I mean, scrotal swelling. And then there is also a way to differentiate between these things. Do you want me to talk about it? So like, you know, how to differentiate between hydrocell, varicocell, and indirect inguinalernet? Let's talk about it. Okay, let's talk about it. So hydrocell is just like, you know, there is a sac and that sac is containing most of the time, a peritoneal fluid. It's very common in children, right? Because, like, you know, sometimes the processes vaginalis gets obliterated during embryologic development, but sometimes that uh, processes vaginalis might persist. That's uh, this processes vaginalis is nothing but it's a peritoneal fold. So, when the testis develops during embryology, it just develops in the pelvic cavity, right? So, it starts as a development there. And the testis will descend through the inguinal canal and it has to end up within the scrotal cavity. So when that fails is you have like undescended testis, right? So that one of the embryologic congenital defects is undescended testis. The other possibility is the testis is descended, but this process is vaginalis or the fold of the peritoneum, which the testis takes itself, takes with itself. When it descends down, should be obliterated. If it doesn't get obliterated, so then there will be that communi free communication between the peritoneal cavity and the scrotal cavity, right? Because like I said, there is a fold of peritoneum here. This is fold of peritoneum, which the testicle takes with itself from the peritoneal cavity down to the scrotal cavity has to be obliterated. When that gets obliterated, there is no chance this content would descend down. But sometimes in certain individuals, there will be that process as vaginalis will never be obliterated. So there will be a chance the small intestine can descend through that defect, okay? It just follows a path which the testicle followed when it was descending during embryologic development. So that's why indirect inguinal hernia is very common in children. So if you have been working with uh, pediatric surgeons, you do one of the very common surgeries they do in pediatric surgery is like, you know, uh, uh, this uh, indirect indirect inguinal hernia surgery. And uh, that's because the process of vaginalis persists and it never gets obliterated. So that's why you have all these intestinal contents coming down. So the intestine, it's coming down and it is, you know, you cannot appreciate the spermatic cord. So that, that I will leave that one there. Just I will talk about it when I talk about the difference between direct and indirect hernia examination. But uh, I was talking about hydrocele. So this high peritoneal cavity produces some amount of peritoneal fluid. So that peritoneal fluid may get a chance to come down here because the process is vaginalis is patent. So whatever fluid is in the peritoneal cavity comes down here. So it just surrounds the testicle. So that's what is meant by hydrocele. Okay. So it, it just happens in adults as well, but in uh, in uh, in children specifically, specifically in children, you may see hydrocele in children when they do have uh, you know persistent processes vaginalis, which is not obliterated. So they may come to you with hydrocele. So this fluid is surrounding the testicle. So there is what is known as a trans elimination test. You take a torch and the guy or the baby is standing in front of you. Then you know this is a, let's assume this is a scrotal cavity. So you try to 
if this is like you know your uh, your torch you just try to trans eliminate mabratuna nabarana we try to see you just apply the light in one end here and you try to see if you can see the light through the other side you know what i mean so you are putting the light here and the examiner is trying to see if they can see the light here so we can we call that trans elimination test so if it is a fluid field scrotal cavity trans elimination test will be positive if it is a hernia the hernia the content is intestinal content it's the bowel there is no way it's going to trans eliminate so trans elimination test will be negative if it is a scrotal mass um, i mean if it is like you know testicular mass it's a solid a solid mass so there is no way there will be a positive trans elimination test so since it is liquid in hydrocell there will be positive trans elimination test the others will not have a positive trans elimination test that's one way and the other thing is the consistency the consistency obviously like if it is fluid field hydrocell it's going to be soft and you can have the three finger test so the three finger test means like you know you apply your three fingers here and what you do is you push here with this finger you push here and you try to feel if the other two fingers are being lifted up because like it's a sack containing if you have a balloon which is full of water you can use this three finger test you can test you can try the three finger test if you push it that means you are increasing the pressure within that sack right so these fingers would be lifted up, the other fingers. Or you can push the middle finger and try to feel if the other fingers are being pushed up by the mass. So that way you can tell whether it is like, you know, a cystic or like, you know, whatever fluid containing mass or not, because that cannot happen if it is a testicular mass or anything like that. The other thing is whether it is easy or difficult to appreciate the testicle. So in hydrocell, it may be very difficult to appreciate the testicle because like, you know, it's already surrounded by a fluid and you may not be able to feel the testicle. And in direct air hernia, if it is not like, you know, big enough, you know, the testicle still can be appreciated. You can still feel the testicle, a normal testicle. You can feel it, and you can appreciate a separate mass above it, sitting above it. And the other thing is hydrocell very difficult. If it is varicocell, varicocells are like these are dilated torches, veins, right? So, so it's just like you know any any like you know varicosity anywhere in the body. So when you try to palpate varicocell, it up appears as if you are feeling a bag of worms, okay? That's how it is described. So when you feel a varicocele, it feels as if you are like palpating in a bag of worms, you know? So, and uh, there is no trans elimination and all that. This is how you can differentiate between a scrotal, I mean, testicular mass, hydrocele, varicocele, okay, on physical examination. And the other thing is in hernia, in hydrocele, there is another physical examination technique which helps you to differentiate between testicular mass versus hernia or hydrocele versus hernia. What is that? So you can see this content is coming along the spermatic cord, right? So normally you can appreciate the spermatic cord. You can feel it above the scrotum, above the scrotum, above the testicles. You can appreciate the cord. The cord is coming here because it's, it's a part of the inguinal canal. So you can appreciate the spermatic cord. If it is a testicular mass, if it is hydrocell, you can still appreciate the spermatic cord, you know, which is sitting, which is coming from above, you know, because the mass is here. So you can still feel the spermatic cord here. If it is indirect inguinal hernia, since the indirect inguinal hernia is coming along the spermatic cord, it may be very difficult to appreciate the spermatic cord. You cannot, you, it, it is very difficult to differentiate, I mean, to separate it from the mass itself. So if you cannot appreciate the spermatic cord above the, the testicle, then that tells you most probably you are dealing with uh, an indirect inguinal hernia. Good to know, guys. Yeah, bag of forms. Mm -hmm. Danny, thank you. Yes, is it is it clear so far? Am I confusing you? Give me thumbs up. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> yes, Matthias, okay. Thumbs up or thumbs down if it's not clear. Okay, good, it's clear. So this is how you differentiate between these things. So a patient with hernia, you see how the questions would go during examination. So 
oh, you know, <laughs> what happens during examinations is the intern tries to save the life of his friends, right? So, or she tries to save her friend's life. So they come to you, oh, last night we have admitted a patient with hernia. So expect a hernia patient in your exam. So this is the information you have. And then you have studied all the anatomy, the boundaries, contents, and everything. And you may wish to hear about questions directly related to hernia, but I will ask you something else. Okay, examine this scrotum. Tell me what's the differential diagnosis. What do you think it is? How do you differentiate? How do you know this is hernia? Yeah. Or oh, what if this is a testicular mass? What if it is hydrocele? What is the mechanism of hydrocele? So I will completely forget hernia and I can focus only on hydrocele. So the questions can go in any different ways. That's why, you know, if I present this to you, I can talk about the hernia and go. But like, you know, the advantage of this webinar is because we can widen the horizon, you know, so that, you know, if examiners are coming in different direction, they cannot really uh, trap you, okay? They cannot trap you. So how do you differentiate between a direct and indirect inguinal hernia? That is very important because like, you know, indirect inguinal hernia, their anatomy is different. Maybe their management is maybe different. So of course it's hernia repair, but you know, you should really understand the difference between the two. Uh, so like I said, their anatomy, their anatomic location, their mechanism is different. Direct inguinal hernia commonly, almost 100%, I would say, happens in elderly individuals, adults, those people who have got high risk occupation or heavy weight lifters. So through time, you know, there may be a defect in the anterior abdomen or if you are just always increasing, you know, if you are lifting heavy weight every day uh, in, a, in your day-to-day -day life, that increases your risk. But most importantly, if there is any any risk factor which might increase your intra-abdominal pressure, for example, it could be chronic constipation patients, uh, for, ex for example, chronic constipation patients with bladder outlet obstruction due to BPH, prostate cancer, they are straining every day, right? You know, they are struggling because they have bladder outlet obstructions, they have to strain for a long time. So that weakens this anterior abdominal wall, there will be a defect in the transversus abdominis well muscle. So these patients may come with uh, direct inguinal hernia. So always, if a patient, let me ask you a question. So if a patient comes with inguinal hernia, let's say 60 years old, what other questions do you want to ask? If you participate, Fast, then we can we can cover many 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 slides. So try for your own sake answer questions fast. What other question do you ask a patient? Let's assume you are an intern, you are working in the emergency department. Somebody came with inguinal hernia. Let's say direct inguinal hernia. What other questions do you want to ask? Because that is very important, even for treatment for management. Okay, you have to know those information. So. What are those those key questions? Um, history of long-standing uh, chronic cough. Yes, chronic cough. Excellent. So patients um, with asthma, COPD. Of, yes, TB, right. asthma, etc. Um, yes, patients who have a history of uh, long-term uh, constipation. Yes, um, patients who have uh, pro problems with urination or who suffer from Problem. difficulty of urination. Yeah. Difficulty of urination. So you want to find out if the patient has let tsunami bilateral L U T A S lower urinary tract symptoms. So there are obstructive symptoms, especially obstructive symptoms should be you have to find out if a patient has obstructive symptoms or not. Hesitancy, poor, poor, uh, I mean, uh, poor stream urine, uh, post micturation dribbling, overflowing continence. All these informations which might suggest the presence of bladder outlet obstruction should be ruled out. They should be ruled out. So urinary complaints, GI complaints in terms of chronic constipation, pulmonary complaints like in terms of chronic cough, asthma, COPD patients and all that, that has to be ruled out. Because if you don't address this risk factor, because the hernia happens because of these risk factors, you know? So if you don't address these risk factors, even if you are a good surgeon, an excellent surgeon, and repair this defect uh, successfully, there is a tendency for it to come back, okay? So what happens is you have to treat the BPH first before you go ahead and do the hernia repair. 
you have to address the chronic constipation before you go ahead and repair the hernia. Otherwise, it's a vicious cycle. You repair it, it comes back because the risk factor is still there. It's not corrected, okay? So you have to know that. That is the reason why you have to ask. So on physical examination, like I said, when there is a basic difference. If the mass is reaching up to the level of the scrotum, rest assured it's in direct inguinal hernia. There is no way direct hernia can reach up to the level of the scrotum. And the other way is, of course, the hernia takes. So you can see if it is just following the, I mean, the hernia is like, you know, following the inguinal canal, then that is indirect inguinal hernia. If the mass is sitting just medial to the, this is the inguinal canal, right? This is the inguinal canal, this is the inguinal canal. If the mass is located medial to the inguinal canal, then definitely that is the direct inguinal hernia. And the other thing is when the patient, the, we do hernia examination in a patient who is standing, the examiner should be sitting next to the patient. So if a patient is standing here, I would be like, you know, sitting to the patient. Patient would be standing here to, like this, and I will be sitting here in front of the patient, and I will support the patient's back with my left hand if I'm right-handed, and I will try to examine my uh, the patient. So this is behind the patient, okay, supporting the patient, and I'm sitting here in front of the patient, and I'm trying to palpate with my hand. So... What you try to do is you try to reduce the mass, you reduce it, and then you try to see whether there is any expansile impulse or not to confirm that this is a hernia or not. And the other thing is some people, there is what is known as finger invagination test. It's not necessary nowadays because, you know, you can do CT scan, you can do ultrasound and all that, you know, imaging can define where the defect is and all that. But in the good old time, so the finger invagination test could also be done. So what we do is we come below from the scrotum. We go through, the, if this is a scrotal cavity, so what we do is we try to go up like this into the inguinal canal. After reducing the mass, you go, you try to invaginate your fingers through the scrotum like this and try to obliterate. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to obliterate the superficial uh, inguinal ring. So these fingers are going there and obliterating the superficial ring. So then I will ask the patient to cough. When the patient coughs or increases in intra-abdominal pressure, if the mass comes and touches the tip of my finger here, what does it mean? If the mass is teaching the, the ch touching the tip of my fingers, what does it mean? Direct or indirect inguinal hernia? Indirect. Indirect, excellent, indirect inguinal hernia, because I am heading in the direction of the inguinal canal, right? And I'm obliterating the external opening of the, the uh, internal, uh, I mean, the external ring of the, the inguinal canal. So if the mass comes and touches me, that means it's protruding through the inguinal canal, so it just touches my, the tip. If it is direct inguinal hernia, let's assume this is a rectus abdominis muscle. And here is the inguinal. Let's assume my finger is heading into the direction of the inguinal canal. So what is this, the areas? This is a defect for the direct inguinal hernia, right? That's where I show you where the uh, direct inguinal hernia can happen. So if the mask comes and touches the medial aspect of my finger, it's direct inguinal hernia. So that way you can differentiate, differentiate between direct and indirect inguinal hernia because my finger is here. So the mass is coming and touching here, the medial aspect of my fingers here, then it's a direct inguinal hernia. And you can also see the mass protruding and going back directly in the anterior abdominal wall if you are dealing with direct inguinal hernia, all right? So this finger invagination test, remember, it could be very painful to the patient. So when you try to do that, if you have to do that, you have to be very gentle because it's going to be very painful to the patient. You are going through the scrotum, lifting the scrotum up, trying to go to the inguinal canal. It could be painful, okay? It could be painful, remember. So sometimes you may not, you may not need to do that. So what kind of hernia do you think is this one? Fast, 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 guys. Don't overthink. These these questions are very easy. What kind of hernia is it? Oh, history prolong. Okay. Recent surgery. Well, that's the previous answer. Okay, you can text in the chat box if you want to participate in a chat box. That's fine. What kind of hernia is this? 
Look closer. It's very easy. All right. Somebody has taken it. So umbilicals. So what clue do you see in, in this picture? What do you see in this picture? Incisional hernia. Yeah, incisional hernia. Excellent. Because like, there is a scar here, guys. You know, there is a scar here. You can see the umbilicus here. I don't know the orientation. <laughs> I think this is going down into the pelvic, into the direction of the pelvis. So there is an incision here anyway, midline incision, and there is this mass here. So if I ask you differential diagnosis, most likely this is an incisional hernia. Could it be something else? Could it be something else? Yes or no? Could it be something else? Yes or no? And if it is yes, what are the other differentials? Lipoma? Yeah, it could be something else. It could be an anterior abdominal wall mass. You never know. There is a scar means it doesn't necessarily mean that solo is a hernia. It could also be a mass which has been resected and it's recurrent mass. I can argue like that, right? So this could be liposarcoma or it could be rhabdomyosarcoma which has been rejected and it came back again. I may argue like that, right? So that's a possibility. So it could be an anterior abdominal wall mass still, and it could also be like, you know, an incisional hernia. So how can we differentiate? We talked about it. So the the, there are different techniques. So if it is reducible, if it has expansile impulse, if you can appreciate a defect when you do like a special incisional hernia, when you do a palpation of the abdomen we will appreciate a defect in the fascia fascial defect will be there like a ring so it is through that fascial defect that this mass is protruding so if it is reducible if it has expansile impulse if you can appreciate a facial defect then this is an incisional hernia if all these are missing and if it is a hard mass sitting so most probably it's a recurrent you know anterior abdominal wall mass all right so this is how i want you to think you know so this is another picture where you can see hernia, so how it can protrude, so strangulation and all that. So you can see here, uh, there, there is some bulge. So on physical examination, there is asymmetry between the right and the left side. Something is bulging here, you know. So when you palpate this area, put your fingers, ask the patient to cough, you'll appreciate expansile impulse. When you try to reduce it, it becomes reducible, all right? So here is another ex, uh, another one. So this is a femoral hernia. Femoral hernia, what did you say? Femoral hernia is located more lateral because this is the inguinal ligament, right? So this is the inguinal canal is around here. So inguinal hernias happen, the direct one hap, uh, happens here, indirect one happens here. So the femoral hernia is more lateral to the inguinal hernias, more lateral and inferior. It's inferior to the inguinal ligament because the inguinal ligament runs from here to, oh, oh, I'm sorry. So the inguinal ligament runs from here to here. So if it is inferiorly located below the inguinal ligament, that's a femoral hernia, okay? So femoral hernia, like I said, it's very common in females compared to males, but still even in females, the commonest type of hernia is what? Inguinal hernia, don't forget, especially in written exams, they may ask you, this is very typical, you can see it's just lateral, and inferior to the inguinal ligament. So this is a femoral hernia. This is a female patient. Like I said, it's more common in females. So, and you can see the content could be like, you know, herniated intestinal loop. I have operated one lady, like I told you, it's a very beautiful picture. I will share it. I will share it in our group so that you can have a look at that one. You can see loop of intestine, like loop of intestine with peristalsis. That was an old lady. I remember and that was femoral hernia and there is a, it comes through the femoral canal. And, uh, you know, the anatomic, uh, anatomic relationship is very important. You do have the van here. So you remember this van from anatomy, you have the vein, you have got the femoral vein, artery, and you have got the nerve here. So van, that's very important. So it's, the content comes more medial to this uh, van contents of the femoral canal, okay? So femoral hernias, it represents about 3% of all hernias, typical interfemoral canal via femoral ring. Mass is palpable at the saphenous opening, at the saphenous ring, and inferior to the inguinal ligaments. This is the inguinal ligament, so you'll appreciate it below. So that's how you differentiate whether it is inguinal, indirect, because it can confuse you with indirect inguinal hernia. 
So the way you can differentiate between indirect inguinal hernia versus femoral hernia is because if the hernia is protruding below, below the inguinal ligament, that is definitely <clears throat> an in the, I mean, a femoral hernia, not indirect inguinal hernia, because the examination of hernia may not be easy in females. And more common in females uh, because they have broader pelvis and not to be confused with saphenous, saphenous valix, which is a dilata dilatation of the great saphenous vein in the femoral triangle. So one of the differential diagnoses for femoral hernia is the saphena, the saphenous varix, which is a dilatation of the great saphenous vein. Okay, so that's its differential diagnosis. That's why always you should understand the anatomy and you can see compared to the inguinal hernia this is what i was saying so the inguinal hernia is located above the inguinal ring the inguinal ligament like i said and it's all uh, superior because the femoral hernia would be here so it's superiorly located and more medial this is more lateral okay more medial and superior than the femoral hernia so that's how you differentiate between femoral hernia and the indirect inguinal hernia. So this is a femoral triangle and all that. So you can uh, you can you can study about this, okay? And in, uh, you can revise this by yourself. And there are contents of femoral hernia, contents uh, femoral contents of the femoral triangle and everything. I will leave that for you. So this is what is meant by you know strangulation and ischemia. So. If the hernia was not reduced for some time, uh, it stays there, pressure builds, then the arterial supply is cut off, then what happens to it is <laughs> part of the wall becomes ischemic. You can see it's already gangrenous. So after reduction, you try to salvage, you try to avoid the reception of intestinal content, intestinal segments. So what you do is, what, what we try to do is we ask for, a warm pack. A pack is like a piece of um, a piece of clothes which is pretty sterile, which we use during surgery. I'm sure you guys have seen packs apply applied in abdominal thoracic surgeries. So we will have a warm saline, sterile saline. We soak it there and we try to warm this area for some times and wait for 10, 15 minutes and all that to see if this segment will uh, regain its viability. If it is not possible and it becomes, uh, you know, if it stays being gangrenous, if the ischemia was really bad, then, you know, you have to cut this segment, cut here, cut here, and do into an anastomosis. Like I said, if it is part of the large bowel, which is strangulated and which has become ischemic, then you don't have any option, but you have to do uh, diversion colostomy, diversion colostomy. But like, you know, like I said, it's not common to have strangulated large bowel. Hernia, very common to have strangulated, incarcerated, uh, small bowel contents, then, you know, that requires resection. What is this, guys? I'm not going to talk about this, but what, what is this? What organ does this mimic? Kidney dish, it looks like a kidney, right? The shape looks like a kidney. That's why they call it a kidney dish. It could be metallic. It could be, you know, plastic. I think I have talked about kidney dish in the instrument section. So there, for many reasons, we use this one, you know, during surgery, when you ask for saline, people can put the saline here and they can give it to you. Uh, you may uh, use it to put surgical specimens, like, you know, any tumor, any resected segment could also be passed to the scrub nurse through this, uh, you know, after you put it in this uh, in this kidney dish. And somebody was asking me, uh, I mean, somebody was talking about it. What is this instrument? I'm not going to talk about it in, in detail. So what is this instrument? Laryngoscope, it's excellent. So this is a laryngoscope. It has a light source here. It's a left sand, left sided instrument. And now you handle it with your left hand and it's used during what? For what procedure do you use this one? Intubation. Intubation, yes, during the time of intubation. Excellent. So let's talk about skin ulcers. So Brooke was asking me to talk a little bit about skin ulcers. There are different types of skin ulcers. We will not be going into the details. I'll just mention them. I how I highlight them. But the most important thing is, as, as a surgical intern, 
as a surgical resident, as any physician, you should be able to communicate with other clinicians. So you should be able to, you should be able to know how to describe ulcer. So skin ulcer happen when there is a problem with blood circulation for the most part. There are four types of skin ulcers. Each one has different causes and slightly different symptoms. So the cause is big, you know, vascular, it could be venous, arterial mixed, neuropathic, diabetic foot ulcer, TEPS, TEPS dorsalis. TEPS dorsalis, syringomyelia. Where do you see uh, TEPS dorsalis? Syphilis, excellent, perfect. So in syphilis and uh, diabetes, gout, uh, hematological sickle cell disease, cryoglobinemia. It could follow trauma, it could follow tumors, infections. <clears throat> so the list is long. <clears throat> the list of, uh, I mean, uh, skin ulcers is really long. So uh, I'm not going, the uh, purpose of this presentation is not to talk about skin ulcers in detail, but you should know. So the cupitus ulcer, pressure ulcer, it's caused by continuous pressure or friction on the skin. So that's why as clinicians, be it, whether you are an internist, pediatrician, gynecologist, so you shouldn't allow your patient to be positioned in a single position for 24 hours. So people have to change their, their position during the time of sleep. Even normal individuals, subconsciously, we change positions, right? So we cannot sleep. Some people, you might hear some people saying, oh, that is not true because subconsciously we do change our position during our time of sleep. And otherwise, like, you know, there will be a pressure applied to a certain part, especially at the areas where there are bony prominences that can result in an ulcer. So these decubitus ulcers often develop on bony areas because the bones would place extra pressure on the skin and the cubitus ulcers usually affect the back, hips, buttocks, ankles, and heels. So when somebody is bedridden, for example, a patient with a stroke, patient with paraplegia due to trauma, any reason, so patients who are bedridden after major surgery, cancer, patients who are like chronically sick, debilitated, bedridden, bedbound, you know, these people are prone to develop the cubitus ulcer. So the cubitus ulcer is very challenging. It has to be prevented. Okay, so the treatment of the cubitus ulcer is very, very challenging. It takes time to heal. It's a pressure area. People would be applying a pressure for a long time. So then there will be ischemia to a certain segment of the skin and all that. So for that reason, you know, even if you try to operate on that area, healing is compromised. And, you know, it's very difficult and challenging for that wound to heal. So prevention is a key. Remember, prevention, that's why you have to advocate, you know, tell the nurses, fight with the nurses, fight with uh, caregivers to change positions. You can see there is a recuperative ulcer happening in the back. You can see uh, this is a sacral ulcer. I think it looks like around the sacrum. So when you are talking about an ulcer, somebody might ask you, like, you know, to describe an ulcer. And when you are trying to describe an ulcer, you have to describe the position or the location of the body part. So if it's in the sacrum, you should say that this is a sacral ulcer. If it is in the leg, you should describe where actually is located, okay? If it is in the legs, if it is in the heel, if it is in the face, wherever it is, describe the body part, describe the area, and describe the ulcer. When you are describing the ulcer, one of the things you should talk about is the size. So roughly try to estimate the size. Most of the time you can use your fingers to estimate the size, okay? Or if you have a measuring tape, you can use a measuring tape, but the problem is you will contaminate it. And if you don't have a disposable measuring tape, it's, I, I don't advise you to do that. If you have disposable kind of measuring tape, you can use it. Otherwise you can put gloves and you can use your finger to estimate the size. So the size should be at least described in two dimensions, okay? So for example, we may say this is three by four centimeter measuring ulcer. Then you can talk about the base. So the base, do you have a necrotic tissue in the base? Do you have a granulation tissue, which is a healthy, I mean, healing, uh, I mean, a granulation tissue would tell you that healing is happening. The base would be clean most of the time. Sometimes the base might be bleeding. So you have to describe if there is a bleeding area, bleeding spot, you should talk about whether there is a bleeding, the base is bleeding or not. If there is a sign of infection, sign of abscess, you should say, oh, there is like, you know, an abscess or it looks like there is like, you know, some infection going on. 
if there is a necrotic tissue, dark tissue, dead tissue, you should say that there is a dead tissue, necrotic tissue in the base and all that. Then the other thing is you should also talk about the border. Is the border irregular? Is the border regular or irregular? Ragged? Is the, bay, is the border raised? You know, sometimes you may have raised border at the edge of the ulcer, or is it flat, you know? Uh, like I said, the base, is it deep ulcer or is it just a superficial ulcer? Is the base superficial? Is the base deep? That's also very important, okay? So in this case, the base is deep, right? We do see some necrotic tissue. It looks like this area seems healthy, but this area, there is some fibrin accumulation. So there is fibrinous tissue in one segment and there is some dark area around here and this one seems healthy this one doesn't seem healthy as such and you have to describe also about the surrounding area so what happens in the surrounding area is there any sign of cellulitis surrounding that ulcer so it looks like in this area there is there seems to be rareness so that's a sign of one of the cardinal signs of inflammation right so maybe there is an associated cellulitis going on just like you know surrounding that area of ulcer okay so the problem is not located in the ulcer so this area is not also healthy it doesn't look like so there could be cellulitis going on most probably there is a cellulitis going on so that's why it's very difficult now for this ulcer to heal, you should uh, avoid further pressure application in that area, right? Unfortunately, we cannot do that without like, you know, uh, moving the patient around, moving the patient around because like, you know, this is a back, patient has a tendency to lie down on the back and then that compromises the healing process because like, you know, it compromises the, the blood supply further, okay? Just give me a moment, guys. Okay, just a second. And that's very important. And the other thing is, like I said, one of the problems is like, you know, for healing to happen, the pressure should be avoided. It shouldn't continue. So, you know, uh, very challenging, like I said. So prevention is very important. Prevention is very important. It's a very painful experience to the patient because if it gets infected, you can see this ulcer. So for example, in comparison with the other one, there is no as such surrounding cellulitis, right? So that one is completely red. You can see there is no as such, you know, cellulitis. It looks like it is healing. This one has healed almost. The scarring is going on. The scarring is going on here. But if you see this ulcer, there is this dark, area so we call it scar ishkar or like you know this is dark region dark area this is necrotic this is a dead tissue so you have to debride this area otherwise this scar will never heal or this ulcer is not going to heal forever if you don't debride this area you know so the cubitus ulcer there are four stages you can read through this one so the superficial one so if it is the skin is intact and broken but it is irritated stage one the stage two would be, you know, skin is broken into the epidermis or dermis. So it's involving the epidermis and dermis. It, has, it hasn't reached the subcutaneous fat layer. And the stage three is if it is involving the subcutaneous tissue, you can see here the subcutaneous fat is involved beyond the skin. Then that is stage three. Stage four is, you know, this ulcer is extending deep into the muscular layer. Sometimes it may affect the ligaments. It may affect the bone. So when that happens, then that is stage four. So if it is a stage four, imagine that's going to be a very painful experience to the surgeon, to the patient as well, because you know the healing takes time. The treatment is going to be challenging because the cubitus ulcer it doesn't heal easily. Sometimes it might require surgeries, like you know, you might need to do, you might need to do uh, surgeries like you know uh, muscle flaps and things like that. So that's, that that makes life very difficult to the surgeon. So prevention is very, very important, okay? So venous skin ulcers, most of the time they happen in the lower extremities. Uh, about 80 to 90% of leg ulcers are venous ulcers. So we will talk about the mechanism. So this is one, one uh, example of a venous ulcer. So venous ulcer happens in a patient who has got Venous insufficiency, like, you know, patients who have got like, you know, varicosities, 
They do have venous insufficiency, which means the valves of the lower extremities are equipped with valves. Those valves sometimes become incompetent. When they become incompetent, what happens is the uh, blood tends to, you know, uh, uh, go back, flow back towards the uh, periphery, towards the foot. So the pressure increases within the venous system. Then the veins becomes distended and all that. Then they irritate the area. The area becomes swollen. The leg becomes swollen. When it becomes swollen, the, the skin becomes stretched. And then there will be a, uh, somehow um, a crack in the skin. And then eventually they develop an ulcer. So most of the times they are very challenging. They don't heal easily because they will, you know, there is associated leg swelling. That will also compromise the arterial supply to that region. So, you know, healing becomes very, very challenging. So venous ulcers, venous stasis ulcers, they are associated with stasis dermatitis, which is inflammation of the skin because of stasis of the blood vessel. I mean, uh, blood flow and swelling. Then stasis dermatitis may be followed by formation of a venous ulcer and it heals very poorly. So uh, what, is the, what is the common complication of venous ulcers, by the way? If a venous ulcer fails to heal, there is a condition called what? Which might be uh, increasing your risk to develop squamous cell carcinoma of the skin. Mm -hmm. Guys, are you with me? So, a complication of venous ulcer, non healing venous ulcer which might put you at risk for squamous cell carcinoma of the skin. What the Marjolis answer, Saba, excellent. So Marjolis answers, yeah. So, you know, like I said, you, if I ask you to describe this ulcer, you can see it's located around the medial aspect of um, the uh, left or right ankle. I don't know which side this is, which <laughs> foot is this. Then if it is right, right, left, left, and then you can describe the IC ulcer, which is about three by two centimeter measuring. And the base is clean and uh, so there is a granulation tissue. It looks like healing is happening. There is no dead tissue. The uh, age is uh, somehow raised and the ulcer base is a little bit deep. Uh, it's not a superficial one, and there is no pus, there is no surrounding inflammation or cellulitis. This is how you can describe it, okay? So when you describe this one in comparison, this is a superficial ulcer, but the problem is there is this dead tissue, uh, dead tissue, so the, I do see a dead part, a dead tissue, and a superficial ulcer, and uh, there, it looks like there is an infection going on, it looks like there is a pus here, so you can see some this charge here so you can describe i do see some discharge coming out i do see some dead tissue and superficial ulcer you know and you can also estimate the size there is no such surrounding inflammation that way you can you can explain it arterial ulcer it's, it's self-explanatory it's very painful most of the time because it's associated with ischemia arterial supply is compromised so arterial ulcers you can see most of the time they happen in foot and uh, they happen in bony prominences and all that. So you can see this ulcer, you can describe, you can tell the size, you can talk about the age. The age is smooth, it, it is not raised as such, but the ulcer is deep. And I do see some fibrin uh, accumulation in the base, but it looks like there is no infection, there is no discharge at least. So you describe it that way. So neuropathic skin ulcers, they are caused by nerve damage. Uh, and narrow arteries are also called diabetic foot ulcers are very common in diabetic foot. And because the uh, problem is like, you know, in diabetic foot ulcer, what happens is these diabetic patients, they have got neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy, so they lose their sensation. So even if they sustain trauma to the foot, they don't feel it, they don't realize it. So they will have a cut in the skin and they are like, you know, prone to infection. If they develop infection in that part, in that ulcer or ulceration then it gets worse and it may become infected so we call it diabetic foot ulcer is very common neuropathic pain is uh, ulcer is common in them so uh, you can see you know this is one of the areas where you may see diabetic foot ulcers these patients if you ask them it's not painful as such you know they will tell you i just realized when i uh, i just realized that i have an ulcer mainly because there is some discharge in my socks, you know? 
that's how they realize it. Most of them, most of the time, they don't realize how they ended up having this. Uh, they don't even remember how they ended up having these ulcers. Most of the time, unfortunately, because of the neuropathy. So diabetic foot ulcer, you know, most of the time it happens in the foot, pony prominences, you know, different locations, different locations. Then it should be able to describe, like I said, the same principle, you know, ulcer is an ulcer in the way, anatomic location, the size, the base, the border, whether there is any associated discharge or not, whether there is any surrounding inflammation or not, okay? Uncommon causes, you can read this, you know, fungal, something like the pyoderma gangrenosum, uh, which is associated with some autoimmune disorders, basal cell carcinomas, common cell carcinoma, melanoma, radiation-related burns, long-term exposure to moisture and all that. So these are not really common, especially in the Ethiopian setup, because, you know, not many people do have access to radiation, but following radiation therapy, patients might develop skin ulceration, okay? Fungal infections and others can also give you ulcers, okay? And malignancies, this is a common cell carcinoma of the skin. You can see, you know, the age is raised, right? So, and somehow uh, blunted, and you can see some dead areas where there is, you know, darkening of the area, and the base seems clean. There is no bleeding age, bleeding uh, part. So, if there is, and there is also some nodularity here. I think this is the eye, it just happens around the eyebrows, you know. You can see if this is the eye. And the surrounding area is like, you know, somehow radiant because there is an ongoing inflammation. This is a very advanced squamous cell carcinoma of the skin, very unfortunate. So it is very big ulcer. You can see there is, you know, mass, you know, there is associated growth because it's squamous cell carcinoma. There is some growth as well. And you can see some discharge infection in between. So it's irregular rugged surface and all that. So that's how you, you describe it. This is typical basal cell carcinoma. Most of the time, basal cell carcinoma may be nodular, a nodular lesion, and there may be some ulceration in between. So it could be just simple nodule, and then it's in, in between, just like you know, in the center, you may see some ulceration. So you have to describe there is a nodular lesion, which is three by two centimeter, or you can say half a centimeter by three millimeter by five millimeter nodularity, and in the center, I do see some ulceration. And you can describe the asset like we talked about. So you have to also talk about the nodularity. There is a nodular lesion in the center. I do see an ulcer. Most probably it's basal cell carcinoma. Fortunately, they are not as such common in Ethiopia. It's very common here in the West. It's one of the very commonest cancer types is the skin cancer. So basal cell carcinoma, you can see there is nodularity. Uh, there is a nodule growing just like you know below the, the clavicle here and uh, there could be some ulceration in between and they are trying to estimate the size. So this is a diff how to differentiate between squamous cell carcinoma and basal cell carcinoma. You can read it for yourself. And this is a melanoma. So just for the sake of uh, completion, I brought it, but you will learn more this uh, about this in dermatology. So you can see this lesion, there is this nevus, but this nevus, it's not typical nevus. There is like, you know, uh, different discoloration, right? Some are dark, some are like, you know, lighter. So this is very suspicious for if a nevus becomes, uh, uh, have uh, start having different colors in, its, in, in the lesion, then that's very suspicious for melanoma. So this is a summary diabetic foot ulcer. This is in the ankle, I think. And this is a simple ulcer. You can see superficial ulcer uh, just around the Achilles tendon. So most probably this person was having an ill-fitting shoes. So that's because of irritation rubbing. So this is venous ulcer. Like I said, most of them happen in legs. And arterial ulcer, most of the time they happen in bony prominences. Like I said, this is a pressure ulcer, very big ulcer. You can see it looks like in the back, okay? So these are the categories. This is how we should describe. All right.